the uh, first international edition of the uh, Zurich Haskell meetup, mm -hmm. um, brought to you by Yuri, uh, with some assistance from myself. Um, so the topic today is going to be building a simple web surface, um, which is something I think that Yuri has wanted to do for a while and also came out of a discussion we had at the last um, general meeting of the Zurich Friend of Haskell, where there was a certain demand for trying out more educational meetups, um, specifically with a view of bridging the gap between using Haskell really in production and doing textbook exercises. Um, so we're going to try to do something that has real applicability to what most people do for their coding jobs every day, but not something that uh, is so complicated that you won't be able to get more than 1% done in a single day. Um, so without further ado, Yuri, the yeah. stage is yours. Hi, welcome everybody. I'm uh, very happy about the turnout. Um, thanks for the introduction, Kazim. So the plan, I mean, the aspirational timeline would be, I give you a little um, presentation about uh, what we plan to build and what, we, uh, what libraries we will use. Then I will uh, bravely do some live coding. Uh, during that time, I will leave it a little bit to Kazim to monitor the Slack channel, to answer some questions. And generally, my aim here is, I know a couple of people in the audience have written very little Haskell before. Um, generally, this is aimed at someone who has uh, already written some code, has done some exercises. And what I hear a lot from people is, okay, this is cool. I can do, uh, you know, a couple of, I can write small exercises, but how do I do something useful? So um, I think it should be like really basic, you know, not everything is super easy, but uh, it should be fairly easy. For those more advanced Haskellers in the audience, I uh, sort of apologize if it is maybe a bit slow, but I suggest that you just like race ahead of me and just build like cool features that we can then talk about later. So um, yeah, let's, uh, Let's get going. So the goal is to um, build this uh, website uh, that I found. There was someone's side project. Uh, can everybody still see my screen? I will take that as yeah, a yes. Currently still fine. Yeah, but the, the website is loading, but you can see it. Huh? I think uh, my girlfriend is also on a video conference call, so we're probably using up all our bandwidth. <laughs> So um, this guy, uh, he started uh, last October. Uh, he built a website uh, for sending cookies that his sister bakes. And um, I thought it was the best thing ever <clears throat> because he, I found him on the internet in a, Slack, uh, in a Hacker News comment. Um, and basically he said, yeah, I have this side business. It's generating $70,000 a month. <laughs> and I started last, last October. And, uh, and so he just described, yeah, I quickly set up this website. It sends like um, a notification to a Slack channel when an order comes in and then we sort of manage it there, like uh, super simple. And you can sort of see the website, you know, is, is kind of pretty, pretty bare bones. I mean, the main feature is that you can click basically uh, when you want something delivered, you can uh, choose how many, uh, and then you uh, click onwards and you go to a payment process. And this is like, by the way, I mean, uh, with his like 70K revenue a month, this is in like two small American cities, I think Fresno and uh, somewhere else. So he delivers like basically to a couple of um, postal codes. So my goal is twofold. First of all, like to show you guys how easy it is to, you know, build something like this. Obviously, we won't like replicating the full features in like 45 minutes. Um, and the other things I would love to see more is just... Um, Haskell is kind of building cool, simple things and not being embarrassed to show them or to, uh, to just make money off of them. Um, because I think uh, we have a cool language where we can get a lot of stuff done and we can also use it for like, you know, actual uh, products or projects. That's personally something that I really like to do. Um, okay, so this is the website. So let's uh, have... Uh, yeah, a little list of uh, features that we want. So we want uh, to serve the site itself. We want to be able to click somewhere to order cookies. Um, let me go full screen again. Oh. 
uh, we want to uh, send notifications to a Slack channel and save orders in the database for like future record keeping. Um, so we chose this set of features because it's like a, a nice, you know, small showcase of a couple of different things you can do. So building a REST API with a framework, um, sending HTTP requests to an external API, in this case Slack, and interacting with a database, which is so useful to do. Um, yeah, as I already hinted at before, the learning goal is, you know, how do we structure a small real world project? So we just start with super simple code. I actually spend more time simplifying the code than I spend time on writing the code, but that's just so that I uh, um, can unconfuse everybody as much as possible. And uh, Haskell sometimes um, can distract you with, uh, with a lot of imports, a lot of language extensions and stuff like that um, before you get started. So I try to keep that at a minimum. Um, so yeah. I, in my opinion, the only way to get better at Haskell, at least that's my personal experience, I only got like sort of decent at it. Well, at first when I read like the Julie Moranuki's book, like Haskell Programming from First Principles. And then once I started um, trying to implement real world um, problems, because only then did I sort of um, get to solve certain things that don't come up in exercises. So I think it's super useful. And I'm going to quickly show you how to set up a really simple but uh, very productive uh, Haskell development environment. That's not a, a lot. Uh, I ask everybody to sort of have um, a compiler up and running and to install GHC ID. Uh, so that is also, um, that would be cool if you had that right now, if you wanted to code along. Um, yeah, and uh, mandatory fun. So we'll try to have fun uh, implementing something pretty simple. All right, um, out of scope. So I won't show you how to deploy anything uh, on, a, on a web server because that would be, um, uh, would take more time. Um, we're gonna like write pretty simple HTML, but as for a real project, you would want to use some library or you would uh, want to write the front end in either a JavaScript framework or something like that. Um, I mean, this is like web development is a big space. Yeah. Um, and also, we'll be using uh, SQLite, so yeah, we won't. Yeah, good boy. Mama, yeah. was here, no financial jam. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Dad. Um, let me just quickly see if I can. Uh, okay, I don't know right now how to mute people, but if you uh, have background noise, uh, feel free to mute yourself. Um, Okay, so also setting up Postgres is a little bit more work. So we'll be using SQLite and authentication is kind of like one of those big topics that also takes a little bit longer to uh, get into. Um, so yeah, that's what we won't be doing. Um, so that's the plan. So our architecture will be to have kind of like a server process that consists both of an API that we generate with a framework and then like just Haskell code behind it. And the cool thing about this is you know, that Haskell code can do anything. It can do I.O., it can really um, do anything you want. So the API itself will serve the side, it will order cookies. You know, you can add endpoints for checking the order status or for, um, for doing a whole bunch of things. We'll send a Slack notification and we'll save it, we'll save orders to a database. Uh, so this part, the cool thing about it is, um, the REST API itself, uh, that's like a really standard thing to do. I'm not aware of how many people of you have a web development um, background or a little bit of experience with it. Um, but uh, REST APIs are like for now the mainstream way to interact with external services, um, at least until GraphQL gets going. And um, so it's like in any language you will find frameworks to do this. So no matter the language you will find, like in Python, it would be Flask. Um, there's, you know, C Sharp and Java have frameworks for generating REST APIs. And uh, so basically what a framework does, it is sort of handling HTTP requests and responding to calls to certain endpoints, um, but kind of doing the underlying plumbing for you. So like returning the right status code and, uh, Kind of doing like threading so when so that you can handle thousands of requests per second or more and logging so that's one side the other side is the code running behind the api and uh, the cool thing is this is just a haskell process 
Um, Haskell has a way of uh, spawning uh, user space threads, they're called green threads. And so I won't go into detail there, but generally you can assume it's pretty fast. If you don't do anything like uh, extremely wrong, then um, it's going to, it's probably not going to be the bottleneck of your application. And you can do anything. You can do network requests, which is what we're doing when we call the Slack API. You can interact with database. You can execute other processes. You can, I don't know, use it as a job runner. You can send emails. You can do like, I don't know, when I sort of realized this, it seemed kind of obvious in hindsight, but uh, it was kind of a cool moment when I realized I can just hook anything up to the web and deploy it on the server. And then from like other machines, I can just trigger any sort of process I want. So um, I think that's basically what everybody's doing now with microservices. You just deploy lots of servers somewhere and they call each other and they run things. Uh, so in this workshop, we will uh, kind of keep our choice of components simple. Um, that doesn't mean you can't like use something more awesome. But it also doesn't mean that the uh, components we use uh, wouldn't totally be viable to use in production. So for the REST API and the routing, we'll use Scotty, pretty simple framework. I'll show you some alternatives in the uh, next slide. Um, Servant is sort of the other mainstream choice. Uh, and for, for the pages, I'll just write plain HTML, just to keep it simple. As I already mentioned, database, I'm going to use SQLite. Um, I'm going to write the queries in plain SQL, of course. Um, if you're writing Haskell pretty soon, you're going to want things to be like as type safe as possible. So there are libraries for that as well. Uh, I'm going to log by just doing put strong. I mean, probably you should log other, uh, like in a, <laughs> with a proper logging library or framework. Um, yeah. And then, you know, later when you can have to manage configurations for your app, you probably want to pass config files, do that sort of stuff. We'll just pass environment variables. Um, as a really quick overview, I think this is more for you to uh, look at later. Like Scotty is like the Flask equivalent uh, of for Haskell. Um, I think it's called inspired by a framework uh, from Ruby that's called Sinatra. Basically, it doesn't do much. You just um, sort of tell it which endpoints to handle and sort of what to do when a request comes in to those endpoints. Um, yeah, Servant sort of makes the routing and the API more type saves. It can also generate documentation, which is super cool when you write something bigger and more serious. Um, and then there's other frameworks that are kind of more batteries included. Um, all of these are pretty interchangeable because they use the web application interface. And we'll also look at a specific example where we use what's called middlewares. And so if you imagine your app is basically just something that takes a request and generates a response. Middlewares are what uh, can go in between and sort of um, modify what happens in between uh, the request handling and the response. So it can do logging, it can do authentication. Middlewares are used for, like, uh, for security, for example, for checking that a request doesn't exceed a certain size because otherwise you'll like, quickly get denial of service attacks on like, production apps. So um, the cool thing about the web application interface is the same libraries, the same utilities and middlewares can be used in most of these frameworks. So it's like a really clever like design decision that happened, I think, by the creator of Yesod. And uh, he also created the warp, the web server, and uh, the application interface. Um, won't go too much into that. So like, just as a word of caution, I mean, web development can at first be a little bit intimidating because you need to, it feels like you need to know a million things in advance to get anything both working and looking kind of good. So, I mean, Haskell is our choice here. That's not forced upon us by web development, but we also need to know HTML, CSS, SQL, when we interact with databases. And at some point, probably we're gonna need to know JavaScript or we're gonna have to be able to use one of the frameworks that generate JavaScript. So if you've done it before, this is super trivial and you'll be like, ah, I, this is not so hard. HTML is not a language. It's just a simple, you know, it's just a, a markup uh, syntax. And, uh, but if you've never done it before, it, it can kind of be annoying because yeah, it's, uh, it's all different syntaxes to learn. So I don't know if you're like into, if you get the satisfaction out of de developing web apps, I think uh, it's worth the effort of learning these things. Um, so, as a side note, there's a lot of uh, frameworks, of course, that 
promise to um, extract abstract all of this. I mean, if you've ever used like something like Django uh, or Rails, I mean, Bootstrap, for example, is just for CSS, but it, it gives you like a lot of the things you would do manually, it kind of gives you out of the box. So Django, you can generate entire applications plus backend plus databases plus the mapping between your application objects and the database uh, rows. Um, so there's many, many choices and it's easy to get overwhelmed with choices. In this uh, workshop, we'll just focus on like super simple stuff. Um, oh yeah, a uh, little note like that I recommend, especially to Haskellers. So um, I've um, sort of became sort of more proactive and better as a programmer once I started to just, uh, actually once I stopped worrying about making everything perfect from the get go. So um, you have this instinct sometimes from untyped languages like uh, Python, maybe also JavaScript, that you need to be really careful how you design your app because like your choices stick with you for a long time. In Haskell, it's kind of the opposite because it's pretty nice to refactor. So you can start out writing pretty dirty code that barely works. Um, and then kind of, as you learn, as you kind of understand more what your app does and where like more, more better guarantees, more type safety is needed, then you can refactor it pretty easily. And in this case, we're writing an application. It has an API, but you're the only consumer of your API for now. So um, you don't even have to provide a stable external interface to what you're writing. So um, if you read a lot of stuff on the internet about like um, people debating which effect managers are uh, the fastest ones and uh, give you the best abstractions, I, if you don't know what they are, I would just suggest don't worry about them for now because it's really not relevant for getting something up and running. Haskell sometimes at the beginning gave me the impression that I needed to know a lot of difficult concepts before even being able to begin uh, being productive. I hope that I can show a little bit in this workshop that that's not totally the case. But of course, like don't exaggerate it, right? Like make it so that you still understand your own code in three days, you know, like long variable names are great. If you have like really complicated steps, it does like, it doesn't matter, matter if it's like uh, three times as many lines as it optimally could be. Because in the end, if you break like something complicated into smaller steps, uh, you're just gonna make it more readable for yourself. So like, don't exaggerate with doing like one-liners and something super clever and compact. Um, yeah, and once you have something up and running, that's great because then you can sort of experiment. Then you can sort of refactor it and you get the feedback of, oh, this uh, kind of made it uh, nicer, it made it more type safe, and, uh, but you have something to measure against instead of having to code for hours before anything works. So, um, I don't know if there are any, I don't assume there are any questions for now, but uh, feel free to uh, interrupt me to just chat out because now we're gonna go to live coding in a second. Um, I'm not monitoring the Slack. Kazim, is there anything, uh, any activity happening there? Just highs. Yep. There, just just highs for now, and a few and a few comments. But yeah, um, if you have any questions, um, just feel free to dump them in the Slack. I will be looking at it. I'm sure others will too. And um, if it's interesting enough for the wide audience, we can uh, interrupt the uh, demo time to discuss it quickly. So yeah, fair warning. I'm probably not. Um, my brain would be overloaded with talking and coding at the same time. So I'm gonna be a little bit more quiet and uh, I'm gonna leave it up to uh, Kazim to monitor and uh, answer some questions. But yeah, I, I'm more than happy to be interrupted, no problem. Um, because first of all, you can tell me um, what what's text size is readable. What do you think, Kazim? Is this... Uh, is it sort of okay? On my screen, it's readable enough, and I've not got the biggest one, so I think most people should be fine. But uh, if there's anybody who really can't see, please, uh, please do say something. Yeah. Um, so uh, I decided to completely start from scratch. So let's actually. Uh, this one. So we are going to, I'm going to use Cabal, but you can use Stack as well. 
Um, so uh, my intention here is really to kind of start with a completely empty project. So I'm going to do uh, about init. I think nowadays it doesn't ask me many questions anymore. Uh, and then we're going to open this and uh, set up hopefully like uh, a nice feedback loop. Uh, let's go again. There we go. So this is an empty Cabal project. So uh, I can already uh, build it with Cabal build. Um, my dependencies should be cached, so it should be pretty fast. Um, but even better, I can use GHCID, and it's going to watch my project and constantly recompile when it sees changes. So this is awesome because it gives me a super fast feedback loop. I put in a syntax error. I happen to also have like GHCIDE in Visual Studio Code, which is great because it gives me uh, type definitions on hover. It gives me uh, error messages and so on, but it's okay if you don't have that for now. Um, and by the way, I want like anyone uh, to code long uh, who feels uh, adventurous. So I, I'll give you a link to a finished project at the end that you can just uh, clone from GitHub, but I kind of think this is more fun. Um, so yeah, uh, how are we gonna start? Uh, we're gonna start adding uh, Scotty to our dependencies. So uh, let's do this. I'm using Scotty, right? I know in the meetup I said I would use Spock, but Scotty is a little bit simpler as I uh, might have indicated in the presentation at the beginning. Um, so I'm gonna like just um, write the code and uh, then I'm going to explain a little bit uh, what it does. In a real project, I would kind of do it the other way around. I would sort of read the documentation. I would sort of figure out how does this work? What's the, like, um, what is the uh, entry point for my app? Uh, and so on and so forth. But I think uh, I'll allow myself to be like a little bit um, faster. So uh, I happen to know that the module, um, is called web.scotty um, and I'm going to use as many qualified imports as I can so that I can um, kind of show you where every uh, function and every utility that I use uh, is coming from. Um, so uh, for now nothing uh, nothing is happening this would crash if I if I uh, execute it but it does compile. Um, I will then before we continue, do something, uh, another little quality of life improvement, which is that um, GHC IDE, uh, sorry, GHC ID um, can actually uh, take the, um, so maybe if I interrupt it really fast right now, you'll see. Um, so what GHC ID does now is it starts Kabal wrapper. So this is like, this is equivalent of GHCI, so this is actually starting GHCI, uh, so the interactive REPL, um, with a bunch of options. But I can tell GHCID what options to start with. Um, and so I will, uh, first of all, do uh, tell it used command uh, cabal REPL. I'm going to ignore all these other like um, arrows, arrow flags and uh, other optimizations. Um, there's another nice setting, which is that uh, you can tell it to restart as soon as your cabal file changes. I think that might be the def default, but I'm going to set it anyway. This is so that it restarts and recompiles as soon as you add a dependency. And then this awesome trick from um, uh, Matt Parsons, at least that's where I first uh, read it, um, is that you can pass to the test flag, which is a little bit of a, not the most ideal name, but that basically um, allows me to specify a function that should run after something successfully compiled. Um, what this does, so now it, it cries, what this does is it compiles and then it runs my app, which is super cool for developing a web server because I can just have it constantly recompile and as soon as uh, 
uh, something has changed, it will um, uh, restart the web server. So I can just open my app in my browser and hit refresh, which is uh, super convenient, saves me a couple of couple of clicks. Um, so now that we have this out of the way, yeah, so this won't do, right? I mean, this is uh, uh, not a working web app yet, but um, as per the REST API definition, um, basically what our server does, it, it replies to, to certain endpoints. And not only does it reply to those endpoints, but it also replies to the verb that this endpoint was called with. So if you remember, uh, somewhere I said that, where is it? I can't find it um, here, that uh, the verbs are get, post, put, patch, delete. So these are all um, different ways of interacting with your API. So get is meant to uh, just read data from the server and uh, not modify any state. Post is exactly modifying state. So you send information and presumably get saved. And then you have like some other like uh, lesser uh, known ones that are not used so much. I marked actually those with a little i that are um, what we call idempotent, um, meaning uh, that if you do the same request twice, it um, won't matter. It's the same as doing it once, which is an extremely nice optimization uh, for certain sorts of error handling. So if I delete a specific record, I want my server sort of to guarantee that if I'm not sure the request succeeded, I want to send uh, the same command again that I'm not mis mistakenly deleting something else, uh, as a little side note. Uh, so let's do the most simple uh, request. So let's uh, say if I get a get request, and I have to put these in a do block because otherwise uh, it won't work. Um, I can serve something if I get the root if my browser for example tries to get the root of um of my app and uh, the easiest thing to uh, serve back would for example be just some text and uh, so um now is the first uh, moment when we have to enable a language extension because Scotty.txt and uh, also I think Scotty.get doesn't actually take a string from the standard library, but it takes uh, a different type that I have to enable the language extension overloaded strings if I want to be able to use kind of string literals. Um, and actually, let me reload this so that it doesn't um, mistakenly think that. An error. Ah, yeah, let me quickly uh, uh, fix my. Um, that's not a little trick. That's not, I mean, not trick, but it's configuration that's not super well documented. If you happen to use GHC IDE, um, you should actually uh, configure it with an hie.yaml uh, file. So that's just. Uh, a way of telling it where the root of your uh, project is and uh, where it should find the dependencies. Let's try it out because then I can nicely show it's still loading. Because then I can show you this awesome feature that other languages have had for a, for a long time, uh, where I can get type definitions on hover, I can get some uh, um, documentation on hover, and uh, a bunch of other nice things, which is super awesome. Uh, so uh, that's it. That's our first, that's our Hello World app, because now I'm uh, serving a web server on port 8080. If something tries to get the root of that web server, I'm going to reply with a text. So let's, uh, let's do it. Let's go to localhost 8080, and we get text back. Amazing. Uh, another alternative would be to return some HTML uh, and we can just be extremely literal. Uh, what happened now? I saved, it got recompiled, it got restarted in the background. I just have to hit refresh in my browser and it serves me HTML. So, um, super cool. Um, I'm gonna now um, 
cheat a little bit and uh, give you uh, finished uh, a finished HTML file. Um, actually, Kazim, how should we do this? Uh, can you post the, our HTML file on a, our index.html on a GIST? Or you can just post the link on it uh, in Slack. If if other people are actually following along right now, it might be kind of nice to um, yep. have. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I mean, yeah. And while you do that, maybe I'll uh, um, like just show you the documentation a little bit to uh, to give you an uh, a kind of a rough idea of how I would find out those methods in the first place, right? I mean, for now, we just have a single import. And so it's all in the web.scotty module. Um, and so you kind of see that the get, post, put, delete, th those are the, um, uh, the handlers for uh, the different REST API, call API calls. And then um, there is a uh, bunch of functions that let me uh, return back different file types. And so the, the great thing about using web framework here is uh, if you know a little bit about uh, how HTTP works is um, it sets a lot of things for me. As I mentioned earlier, the return code, but also the right headers. So for example, um, there's, what's it called? File type or MIME type? Um, the MIME type, yeah. Yeah, so the MIME type would be a header that tells the application, the browser or anything that consumes it what kind of document I am receiving because JSON, for example, is also a text document, right? It's plain text, but it is useful for me to know that it is JSON. And another header would be able to say that it's gzip. Another header would uh, specify that it's HTML. For example, if I hear, um, oh, uh, wait, let's, uh, I already want to find, if I return text and then with this HTML content, it sort of like would do it ad verbatim. So the, um, the return file type, uh, MIME type, is super important for the consumer application to know what it uh, what it has to handle and how it has to handle it. Um, um, so, quick question that actually just popped up in the Slack that's probably quite important. Yes. Um, so, why we use that language extension? Um, everybody who's used Haskell uh, to actually build anything is familiar with this. For those who might not have, um, so Haskell obviously has the standard library string type, but that's not the only string type it has. Um, there's also uh, the famous byte strings that you might have heard of, and then there is um, data.text, which sort of is a replacement for the standard library string type because the standard library string type being a, a linked list of characters is just not very efficient. Um, so some libraries use text, so like Scott, he actually uses the data.text type rather than strings. And overloaded strings is just a way of um, being able to write string literals that can be byte strings or data.text uh, string literals rather than just a st uh, standard library string so you don't have to manually call conversion functions all the time. Um, if you're unfamiliar with this, I do recommend um, reading up on it because it's a, a perennial annoyance with Haskell development. It's slightly annoying, it's manageable, um, but yeah, you do run into it. I would say on some levels, it's like, the, um, it's essential complexity because once you write serious code, there's a big difference between passing back a, a byte string, which is basically just binary data. I mean, yes, you can display it somehow as text, but not really meaningfully because I mean, it's just like the any type, right? You can put anything into binary that is representable in the computer. Uh, whereas text, especially now with Unicode handling and emojis is way, way more complex than you would want it to be. So um, there's some essential complexity here. So the conversion to and from uh, kind of makes sense and it does kind of nudge you towards thinking a little bit about what you mean by when you use a string. Um, and yeah, so what Kazim said is correct. And just, um, it wasn't obvious to me at first when I learned it, but I didn't know what a literal was. So a literal just means like when you type it into your editor, because for example, if I write one, two, three, that is a literal, but it could um, both be, uh, so let's do one, two, three. 
I mean, it could both be int um, or float. Uh, wait, um, blah equals this. So does this compile or am I an idiot? Um, ah, it uh, doesn't want to. I'm doing an assignment statement, of course. So I mean, the fact that I uh, that both of these are valid are because one, two, three is just a literal. It's not in itself already a type. So that is just um, you know an ambiguity that uh, that most languages have that when you type something out. It's not clear what um, what the type of it is, and string literals basically anything that you could put between quotes is a string literal, and a lot of different data types can sort of grab that and say, oh, I'm like this is my type. I can uh, I can handle this. So if I uh, sort of said that this is a string, it would tell me no, it isn't. It is uh, uh, it is data text internal. It's lazy text instead of string. Um, so Without this import, uh, the only literal that it accepts would be string. So that would uh, coerce the type. Um, so where were we? Ah, yeah. So I cheated uh, while we were talking. I added this uh, like beautifully crafted HTML file. I added it under this subfolder called site. And I added uh, a CSS file. If you don't know Tailwind CSS, it's awesome. Uh, you should use it. It's basically like CSS with a thin layer of uh, making it composable. So what you end up having is all these sort of utility classes. Don't worry about it. It looks noisy. It's still super great to use. Um, but we'll just uh, go ahead with it just so we can show something on the screen. So uh, that would be the next step. So I don't want to write out my entire index.html here in a string. Um, so the next utility function I can do is I can tell Scotty serve me a file instead of serve me this string. So we do site slash index dot HTML. All right, it recompiled, restarted, and there we go. And oh no, it looks like it looks like crap. You know, I did all this work with uh, the CSS. That is because basically now our browser is asking for like uh, for you know the root director, the root uh, endpoint of, of our API. And I'm just uh, telling it, yeah, give it back this, uh, this index.html file. If I were to use the CSS, the browser actually also have to tr has to transmit the CSS. But so how do I do that, right? I mean, I can only, uh, I'm, I'm guessing I could, actually, I, I never tried that. Let's try that. I, I'm guessing I could return uh, two files. Let's uh, try this out. I never, it doesn't actually make sense because then which file would it, would it show? But uh, min.css. So let's see what it does. Yeah, it just serves the last file that I that I put here. So the order of this totally determines which file is served. So that won't do. So to the rescue um, will be our first middleware that we're going to use. So this middleware is just going to like serve static files because we're going to have to, at some point, serve loads of, we're going to have to serve images, we're going to have to serve like fav icons, maybe some like font uh, files and so on and so forth. So basically, I want a generic way to say, just serve anything in that directory if it is uh, referenced by, by something else. Um, and that's what we're going to do now. So I happen to know, because I spent more time on it than you, uh, that that middleware is, uh, lives in y extra no actually it doesn't i think it lives in uh, uh y middleware something and i'll just point out um that this uh, i'll just point out uh, that why we're talking ghc id is like bravely recompiling all the time which is so awesome um so let me quickly check yeah, I was wrong. So it's not actually something that's in the package uh, Y extra, even though we're going to do that. We're going to leave it in there because we're going to use it in a, in a minute. But it's in a package called Y middleware static. And I think this is like the number one uh, middleware that's being used everywhere. Um, so maybe like as a little, yeah, no, I already explained intuitively what middlewares do. So. I'm going to allow myself to just use it, and then we're going to uh, see if there's any questions about it, and then we can go into more detail if there's if there's need. But I think it's going to be cool to just um, 
uh, to just go ahead and use it. So I'm going to do another import while middleware static. Um, GHCID rightfully complains that I'm not using it. So uh, that's one small downside. Like actually my app won't start if there's even any warnings. So not just if there's errors, but also on warnings. I'm sure I could switch those warnings off, but I like them. Um, and the middleware goes sort of in between the app and the endpoints that are being served. So again, apologies for like not uh, doing all the explaining up front, but uh, basically the way to insert any sort of middleware is to do uh, uh, scotty.middleware and then I give it uh, kind of a middleware with the parameters that, uh, that we want. Um, so uh, let's show off what our editor can do. So uh, undefined, that will crash once it runs, but we have static and then we can uh, kind of explore what uh, function static exposes. So it happens to be in this case that we want a static, um, static policy and we want uh, uh, to add a base directory and in this case, it's called site because that's what I called it. Um, cool, let's go back into our app, refresh it. And now it serves the HTML plus the CSS files or whatever else it needs. So actually let's add some logging middleware so that we can uh, observe the requests as they come in. Because for now, wait, let me actually make this a bit smaller so we can see a couple of things at the same time. Um, so, oh, okay, success. Um, so I am going to import the um, logging middleware um, that is exposed in Y extra. So since I already um, added that to my cabal file, that library is already compiled and ready for me to use. It's called middleware request logger. And basically what I get is a couple of choices for um, request logging. And I'm going to use, um, which one am I going to use? So there is log standard out. That one's a bit boring, but it is the standard Apache format. So if I reload everything, we can see the kind of the get request that's coming in to root and uh, actually no this is the return uh, so no the rec request goes to root return is 200 which is http uh, status code for success and a bunch of other um, i think this is the user agent so a bunch of other information it's very standardized not so nice not so readable so instead we're going to use log standard dev which not only formats like nicer but it also has colors so that's awesome so basically um, what are we seeing? I'm seeing that there is a get request to root and it serves the, um, the site. What I'm a little bit surprised by is why it doesn't also show um, the CSS file being served. I guess it might be in cache or do we have to recompile? Okay. We we'll figure that out later. I was under the impression that it was also um, going to show the CSS file being served. All right, moving on. Um, so we have a we have a site, which is awesome. I mean, I did the work for you, but uh, it's still great that we can see something. Uh, we veered off a little bit of the design of the uh, cookie site, but I think we have like some our own sales pitch, which is very convincing, very. Uh, very great. We sell a lot of cookies. Um, so the next um, step would be to have a way of having the site um, transmit information back to the server. And there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, nowadays, the standard way to do that would involve um, writing some JavaScript and kind of taking all these, the values in all these fields and coding them as JSON and sending them in the request body as uh, JSON. Um, 
we're not going to do that because we want to for now just skip javascript and um there's also more old school ways that are super robust and that work very well so one is that we would pass them somehow in the url so we could say uh we could have an endpoint that would be order and then uh, please yell at me if i get the syntax wrong but i uh should be able to pass uh key value things um so i should be able to pass a list of key values uh in the url uh you for sure have seen this in uh, a lot of website uh, urls being done so that basically would allow the server to extract these this information about these key value pairs that's cool but um in this case i chose a different way to do it which is that html has a form tag the form tag can like um while i explain it why don't i just show it the form tag itself so let's uh, find form cool. uh, so the form tag itself can um, specify an action which would be the endpoint that it hits with uh, the method that it's going to use and fields like input fields um, checkboxes and a bunch of other stuff within that uh, that form context from here to here um, can basically um, give themselves a name and the name will be kind of the key and the value will be whatever is um, in that uh, input field so in the input field it would be kind of like the the string the number or it could be in a in case of a checkbox true or false um so this means that the browser can simply uh, extract this information so i click on this continue button it will uh forward me basically it will uh bring me to the i can has endpoint um and in this case i haven't handled that endpoint yet so the framework scotty correctly gives back a 404 error which is that it can't find this endpoint and can't respond to it um, but what you can already see is that in the request body i have the values that i want to extract so i didn't fill out my address or my email so those are empty but i already have sort of this delivery time string very ugly and the amount um, you might want to pull that window up a little bit so that's uh, the logging output is visible. Like this? Yep. And also, okay, good. Thank you. Good to know. I can also pull it over a little bit. I don't know, maybe the, maybe Zoom swallows the borders a little bit. So let's do it like this. Um, cool. So uh, let's do some super dirty coding, which is that we're just going to get Scotty to extract those parameters and then print them let's see if i get this right so in this case we want to respond to post request not to a get request and we want to respond to uh, the endpoint i can pass i think that's what i called it great um and then uh, something so now i'm going to uh, just again pretend that we've all read the documentation um and i'm going to extract the parameters uh from uh let's actually just i'm going to extract the parameters uh from the endpoint and then i'm going to just be um, extremely lazy and do uh, no proper logging at all but i'm gonna do uh not put stroll in. yeah let's do this show params okay so now it's going to complain because this is put stroll from the standard library as far as i know um that expects string um but oh there's two problems actually so first of all this ex expects string Oh no, show, but show should give it a string instance. Okay, let's jump to what I thought the second problem was. The second problem is this entire context in here um, happens in uh, the Scotty monad. So basically, all of this um, has type Scotty M and then unit. Um, I can uh, do this type annotation later. To uh, But yeah, basically, if you look at the type signature of uh, serving our app, it takes the port. The port is an alias for uh, integer, I think. 
and then it has this Scotty M. So this doesn't happen in um, IO, even though the surrounding context happens in IO. So again, a little bit of hand waving um, that you're going to have to use it often. So I don't really feel too bad about just um, just using it instead of uh, explaining it too much. But um, Scotty has an instant where it can lift things into the IO monad. Otherwise, it couldn't do IO. That's all that Scotty is doing. It's uh, it's doing input output actions like handling HTTP requests and giving um, writing back to the network. Um, and so because of this, uh, we can lift any action in Scotty into IO. Um, and this is imported from control monad uh, transformers. Uh, I think that's what it stands for. And so basically any IO action we wanna do in here because we don't do proper logging, we just have to lift into the IO monad. Okay. Um, I hope that wasn't too hand wavy. Those were like the things that intimidated me a little bit when I uh, was more of a Haskell beginner, but I think, um, let's see, let's send something to Zurich. At, by the way, uh, Chrome is pretty cool in that it already prevents me from entering an invalid email address. It kind of half works, but that's already nice. So. Um, all right, let's send this. And so now, in addition to our beautiful logging, we also have somewhere um, a very ugly, so it would be this line, um, a very ugly printout of the parameters that we got. Um, maybe let's jump quickly to the documentation. So scotty.params will uh, like this so that it has the proper um, type definitions. Uh, so let's see, params. Um, Scotty.params. So there's one extracting one parameter that does something slightly different. I can show that later. But params basically, what I should mention, what it does, it extracts the two types of parameters that I explained the form encoded ones that we're using but it would also extract the parameters in the URL. So if I had something uh, like this, oh, actually, let's try it out. Um, what would happen if I did this? Ah, it does not found because when I do it with the browser, it does a get request instead of a post request. Uh, but actually, let's, I still want to find out what happens if I call this manually. Um, yeah, so as you can see, uh, params extracts both the parameters in the URL and the parameters that are in the form itself. Which one takes precedence? I don't know, we could do the experiment, but right now I don't care because it would be sort of weird to mix the two. But just so you know, it, it extracts both. Um, so, oh, I didn't even uh, properly do it. Um, quick input on that. So it do actually does this in order. So mm -hmm. it gets capture parameters first. So things that are part of the URL, then form parameters, and then oh, yeah. parameters. So I am assuming that the query parameters would actually overwrite the form parameters, but I, uh, I have not what, tested um, that yet either. Okay, I don't actually know what captcha is. So there's three types, huh? Captcha, form, and query. Uh, basically, in Scotty, you can define um, sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could do uh, URLs, right? Exactly. You can do uh, slash and then uh, something, and then you can extract the parameter with the name something. So I could say I can has and then slash, like for example, we could do uh, get order status and then slash 12. Uh, and then it would, for example, if we code the endpoint that way, it would code, it would bring, give me back the status of order number 12. Yeah. Okay, so that's, uh, that's capture parameters then I guess. Very cool. Uh, so let's undo this damage and um, and just leave it at that. So again, I post it uh, prints the parameters. Where is it? These ones. Um, yeah. And so I just wanted to quickly show. So I we can go to documentation. We can see. Okay, params does what we want to do. Maybe it would have taken two minutes to find it. Um, and then we quickly quickly want to inspect this type because um, a lot of Haskell libraries love defining their open own types or type aliases for things. So just because it's called params doesn't mean it's something super custom. And as we can see, it's just um, a tuple of text and text. So key values. So basically what we printed out uh, here 
would be a list of, of key value tuples. Um, so uh, let's see what, what we should do next. So we want to do two things, right? We want to send it onwards to Slack, and I want to save it in a database. Um, I think, which one are people more interested in? Because I think I should kind of do one in detail, and the other I should kind of uh, just maybe copy paste a little bit faster because I want to give everybody enough time to just do their own coding, experiment, um, and uh, and kind of, yeah, get their own hands dirty. Um, so if people could tell me on Slack, let me quickly check. Um, Actually, I, should, I think I could do a vote somewhere. But yeah, just, just write in Slack if you want me to do show database or you want me to show Slack integration. Any consensus emerging or are people shy? Let me check. Database, okay, cool. Database fans, yeah, love it. Okay, I hope I didn't influence this uh, this poll. Cool. Um, so yeah, let's do the simplest thing. It's literally called uh, it's a family of database libraries called something dash simple. There's Postgres simple. There's SQLite simple, and um, yeah, what this uh, what this does, it provides um, you a SQLite instance, and I think it's compiled in. So it's not going to use the SQLite um, executable from your uh, operating system, I mean, on your machine, which like literally every machine has SQLite uh, running on it, like somewhere on it. Um, but it's going to use its own. Um, so let's do that first. Um, let's first find out. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so now um, we would like to first of all initialize an empty database. I'm going to do this in a new in a new file. So we're going to do db.hs, uh, super simple stuff, and um, I'm going to. Uh, first of all, import the SQLite module that I just added to uh, my cabal file, and I'm also going to use overloaded strings already in anticipation of that we're going to have to use it. Um, okay, so let's see, it still compiles. Um, is that because it works, or is that because I haven't added it to? I think I need to add it to other modules. So, um, Yes, so Cabal is weird. The newer versions are a little bit less weird, but I need to tell it that this module actually belongs to my project. Uh, okay, cool. And we can see that it works because it complains. Uh, so I'm not using this. Let's reload it. Mm. So first thing I want to do is I want to initialize my database. So I'm just going to call it init. Uh, maybe I'm gonna pass it just a file name that I can uh, so I can control where it saves the, the database and then I want um, to return a connection. So this is what I the, the pre-work that I did. So it's uh, called uh, SQL connection and with a SQL connection you can execute SQL statements, uh, simple stuff. So let's call this DB file name. Uh, equals so let's do and so yeah we do do because we're in io and uh in this library it's just uh, called sql open and then db file name uh and then uh, uh, uh ah, yeah of course so that's it. We uh, I don't know who prefers uh, return, who prefers pure. I don't care. Um, so basically, now we created a connection and uh, give it back. Um, we are not executing this yet, but 
best uh, place to do this would be in our main do block. So outside of whatever Scotty does, um, we would do uh, db.init and we still have to order, uh, import that, but let's call it orders.db. Cool. Uh, import db. Does this work? Awesome. It compiles, it just doesn't use it yet. Um, so let's uh da, 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 da. let's see i think actually it shouldn't complain because this already does something but right now ah, it complains because i'm not using connection um so now it actually already initialized the database so let's go check if it uh, creates it ah. uh, make this bigger again uh, because I'm actually suspicious of Haskell's laziness. So it could be that unless I uh, actually execute a statement that it doesn't create the database yet. So let's go look, has cookie demo. Nice, it created it. So we have an orders.db. Um, <clears throat> so why don't we connect to it? And uh, uh, well, there won't be anything in there yet because I'm now going to do some shameless copy pasting. So, ah, yeah, what I wanted to find out, uh, just uh, because I'm curious, um, let's see, it doesn't have autocomplete, uh, SQLite uh, version. So you can ask SQLite, what is your version? And uh, so this is my system version uh, and it is 3.24. So let's, do the same thing in uh, Haskell. So let's go and ask it uh, why we do this. Let's say uh, something and we do uh, SQL. Uh, we use query. Don't ask me right now. Ah, yeah, so query underscore. So there is a way to do this like kind of nice and type safe. So we can uh, define our own data types and give it instances of from row and to row. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to um, do something a little bit like more stringy. Uh, so basically, I'm copy pasting in um, this uh, command that I uh, wanted to uh, get the output out of. It is complaining now, not because I did something wrong, but because it's not clear what type, what the return type of this should be. Um, so. I'm gonna, again, keep it super simple. The, the, so SQLite is not actually typed. So even if you define column types like int and string, it doesn't mean anything because SQLite will still let you put a string in an integer column. So it's kind of like very, very aspirational. It's designed that way on purpose. I would never like say anything bad about SQLite, but in this case, like there's no point in, in thinking we should get some some guarantees that uh, isn't that aren't actually there. So here I just like, force the return type to be IO and then list of list of string is because we have a list of rows uh, and every row is a list of cells. So uh, this is just what it is. And so now I'm just gonna, because I know it returns kind of just like one row with one cell, I'm gonna do the world's uh, ugliest pattern matching. So I'm gonna say uh, version and then whatever else. Uh, but this um, is kind of like, lacking one level of nesting. So I'm going to uh, say, so this is deconstructing the columns, the rows. And so I'm gonna also deconstruct the cells and I think this should work. Yeah, awesome. Uh, what do we do with it? Uh, when in doubt, just put strong and then version Does this work. Yeah, it works. Um, so, ah yeah, here it is. So 328, so cool. The Haskell library uh, gives us a newer version than uh, than my system uh, SQLite. Um, okay, let's make it a little bit nicer. Maybe let's do it like this. So SQLite version three twenty eight. Um, that's our very professional logging. So now I'm gonna copy paste in a longer SQL statement because that's faster than typing it up. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with SQL. Again, something super worth knowing. Um, basically, I'm going to create a table if it doesn't already exist. So if it exists, I'm not going to like um, override it with an empty one. I'm going to call it orders. 
and I'm gonna have an ID, uh, which is a, gonna be a primary key. I'm gonna like have a column called amount. Again, doesn't matter if this is integer or string right now, we'll just uh, like have it working anyway. Uh, we have an email, we have an address, and we have a delivery time. So this corresponds to the to our fields that we want to save. Cool. So now, um, if I'm not mistaken, I should be able to just uh, select everything from orders. Uh, well, maybe it would help if I did it right. Okay, so nothing there yet, and by default it doesn't uh, print the uh, the columns, but we can see that uh, the data, the table itself exists. Um, okay, so the next. Um, function that we would want to use would be save order. So basically it would take a SQL uh, connection no. um, and something else. Um, and I'm going to take another shortcut. So you remember how we have the um, parameters as a list of key values. Well, um, I'm going to jump ahead uh, and actually do it properly. Uh, so I'm going to um, import collections. Collections has um, maps, hash maps, and uh, so this is for those that are not familiar with it. Uh, I mean, it's not um, not too much to it. So basically, a map is uh, what would be a dictionary in other, langu in other languages. And um, I want it to be um, a map of uh, these key values. And uh, that means I need to do another import. So in this case, um, I think I want, so data.text would by default be strict. So it wouldn't be uh, text.lazy for those that are wondering. Um, and so now, uh, let's see, let's just recompile. No, wait, that's not what I wanted. Uh, CID. So, yeah, basically I want um, a dictionary where the keys are text and the values are also text. And uh, so saving the order would just uh, perform an IO action. Um, okay, so this is something, mystery function. Let's see, what is it complaining about? I must have typed something wrong, so. Uh, uh, uh. Let's see, I'm an idiot. It's not called collections, I'm in Python land. Uh, it's called containers. <laughs> uh, so let's do this. So for those following along at this point still, your compilation might be a little bit longer, minus like, because I did it so often, it's it's all in cache. Um, cool, yeah, so all we need to do is figure out now what to, what to execute when we get, um, a dictionary of key values. But um, before we write it, let's actually just, um, let's first use it and then write it. So let's see, what do we need to do? So now we have sort of a, a list of, of these key values. So we have these this list of parameters. We're going to have to transform it into a dictionary. Um, and I'll show you why I'm going to use a dictionary in a second. Basically, it has to do with, I just want to be able to extract the values because I know the keys. The keys are going to be uh, amount, email, address, delivery time. Um, and I just want a way of extracting the values. And if it isn't there, for now, I'm just going to give it a default uh, value of empty string. Um, so let's, uh, let's do this. So the, um, uh, naive thing to do would be order params dict would be uh, map. I'm going to call it dict even because I like that better than the word map. Uh, from list, map from list uh, params. And it's going to complain because, well, not for the, um, not for the right reasons. Um, so it's, Ah, yeah, no, it doesn't complain yet. Um, you're going to see uh, the parameters use, I think, lazy text and SQLite wants strict text. So there's what uh, Kazim mentioned earlier. You have to do some conversion uh, to and from. So we're gonna do, um, 
well yeah we're gonna just uh we're just gonna use our function that we haven't written yet so we do db dot save order um i think it takes a connection and then it takes um our orders well let's copy paste this so going to hmm? ah that's where i give it a name okay so um here's what i anticipated because i ran into it before not because i am thinking ahead all that much uh, so basically, um, yeah, the parameters are extracted lazily, but uh, as lazy text and uh, um, SQLite needs strict text. So we're going to um, convert it. Actually, I'm going to like take the luxury of just copy pasting uh, the solution in. So basically, we need to import this um the lazy module and then we are going to well obviously also need to import the types of the strict module and then we're just going to have a little helper function that converts a list of key values uh that are lazy to a list of key values that are that are strict text um anything mysterious about this i don't think so i think i just map this two strict function over this list and basically my two strict function takes a tuple and applies text lazy two strict conversion to both elements i think that shouldn't be too terrible so we're going to apply that right here um cool so next thing what is it ex what is it um complaining about yes i'm uh, uh oh yeah Obviously, I forgot to do lift IO um, because otherwise it is in the Scotty action monad and not in the IO monad. And mysteriously, it compiles. I'm happy about that. Um, if we uh, send off a request, it uh, like rightfully crashes because we left our implementation of our save order function undefined. Let's remedy that um so let's see now all we need to do um i'm going to first write it and then uh explain why we do what we do um so basically uh we're going to execute a command against the connection that we have and our uh, SQL statement will be insert into orders um, something 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 uh, and some values and then something 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 so like most um, SQL libraries also in other languages um, you can use sort of question mark for for placeholders uh, not very type safe but that is sort of where I encourage you to go and find other libraries and uh, refine it once you need to make it a little bit more like safe at compile time. So basically uh, we are going to insert the um, uh, values, the columns that we defined up here. So we have address and delivery time. Um, so now all that's missing is the um, list of the actual values that we have. Um, so there's a way to do, um, so actually here I'm going to be a bit type safe. So there's, um, let's say Haskell, um, let's go to data.map. Um, so there's a way of extracting the value for a given key. So it would be lookup. There's a very untype safe way to do it, which is just uh, the same as using uh, list indices. So basically you can just do, I oh know actually list indices is uh, double exclamation mark. So here we are just going to get the value of this map with a given key. I'm going to make it a little bit type safe. So I'm actually going to use uh, the proper, proper lookup, but I'm going to give it a default value. So, just because I can't be bothered to handle the cases where the address or the delivery time is uh, empty. But of course, in a real application, 
you have to do some sort of validation step at some point in time when you get input you want it to conform to your business logic and just uh, um, kind of guarantee that uh, certain things exist that you, even if it exists that the string isn't empty the email addresses are valid and so on and so forth so we're going to do a map and it's called uh, find with default the default is going to be empty string and we're going to well here it would be amount and uh, we get this from well we still haven't given it a name connection and uh, all the params map so let's say we would do this but how many do we have four times so so in the actual code repo that I sent you, I actually made this a little bit nicer. I extracted sort of this out into a helper function, but this is fine for now. So we can just, uh... okay, it compiles. So um, let's see if it actually works. So we uh, have 12 cookies. Uh, we want to have it delivered here. And we want, ah, don't care what the email address. Cool. So first of all, it didn't crash. So that's a huge success. It uh, returns status 200. Um, so presumably something went right. If we go into uh, the database itself, uh, we actually have a row added that is uh, that contains our order. Um, I'm going to take a little pause here now. So just quickly uh, check Slack. Um, Yes, so wait, there's a um, there's one comment that I could just use uh, in here. I could just do um, this. Uh, the reason I didn't do this is because I uh, <laughs> I still wanted to, uh, I don't know, have good habits because if I deconstruct this, it's always going to, well, it's, it's at least, it's going to work in the sense that it's not going to uh, crash. Whereas here, if by any sort of, magical reason uh sqlite starts delivering like you know two rows if i ask for the version or two columns um then it would fail on an incomplete pattern match because this literally matches only on list of lists where the inner list contains one element and so uh that's why i did this at the expense of it being a little bit more ugly but yeah um yes our crown is uh, celebrating that we have a row um so I'm going to take the next 10 minutes to um, exceptions. Yeah, so exception handling is a big topic in um, in Haskell. There is really good libraries to do it, and it's a little bit out of scope for what we, what we do right now. I think here we can rely on Scotty's exception handling. So if I um, do anything, I think I can do error and then uh, some error message. Uh, so if I throw an exception in my application, um, and then let's say I send to icon has, um, ah, but that wasn't a post request, that was a get request, so let's do this. So um, yeah, actually Scotty crashes. So I think there's some um, types of exception, I think I've seen Scotty handle, but I'm not super sure about it. But yeah, definitely as soon as you write a production app, uh, you would want to be a bit more sophisticated about this. So you would have, want to have a wrapper. So I would, for example, recommend the library called Bracket. And uh, either Kazimo or Andreas, who are more experienced than me, can like uh, correct me on that or suggest other things or um, uh, any other information that I don't, that I don't know that uh, would be good in this context. Um, okay, so... If there are no other questions, I think I will rush through a little bit to the through the like um, Slack integration because I think uh, it's fun to see, but uh, it's also fun if you guys get to code and implement your own ideas. Predictably, I'm gonna um, create a separate module, module Slack. How do you actually write? Yeah, where? Um, Ah, yeah, control that exception is like the old school uh, package for those people that don't see or maybe for the video recording afterwards. I guess on YouTube, we won't be able to see the questions in Slack. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, control 
dot exception is like the exception module that comes with base, and I think it uh, you can probably um, do most of the basic basic stuff. Um, so let's uh, we add a Slack module. Let's add it to other modules, and let's do some glorious um, copy pasting. Some good tips in Slack. So. Uh, Kiriline uh, says it's better to use safe exceptions. Um, that's uh, the name of a package. So yeah, that's cool too. Um, I haven't used it yet. <coughs> oh, let me actually quickly, no, let's, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so a bunch of imports first, and then I'm going to explain them. So um, in this case, we're going to do like an additional cool thing, like a couple of additional cool things. So first we're going to, so this doesn't compile yet because we haven't added the packages yet. First, we're gonna like see how to handle JSON. That's like upgrade number one now for our Haskell skills. Uh, the ASIN package is like the canonical way to handle JSON. Then we're going to um, use um, the, I think it's from the conduit package, we're going to use um, the HTTP simple library, which is super cool. It just lets us fire off HTTP requests the same way our browser was now able to send post and get requests to our server. We can now simply um, trigger such requests from our application ourselves. So let's add the necessary dependencies. So I believe we need to add ASIN. Um, is it called ASIN or is it uppercase A? I never know. No, ASIN is great. So let's see. Um, yeah. Oh, actually, helpfully, it um, reminds us. So this is a super cool feature because it already somewhere has a package, probably Scotty, that depends on uh, this HTTP conduit library. It is smart enough to tell me, look, this uh, package is already there as sort of an indirect dependency. I just have to add it as a direct dependency, which is super badass. Um, so I add it, everything compiles, or it doesn't. It does. Um, let's just refresh it so that we force it to become colored. Um, okay, reload so that my GHC IDE plugin can see the new packages. Um, cool, so we're going to do three things that I think are super awesome. First of all, sending HTTP requests. Second of all, handling JSON. And we'll see like a very easy way to create JSON from a data type that we define. But then, more importantly, while well, it's kind of related, we're going to use the language extension called derived generic. Um, with the type class from ghc.generics. So this is in base. So this is nothing, not a package we imported. This is like one of like the most amazing GHC features that saves a lot of boilerplate, maybe for some people in the audience that, uh, wrote, that um, have some experience with Elm, where you need to write uh, JSON decoders by hand, which also has a lot of benefits because you can see the code right in front of you. So I'm actually quite a fan of writing really explicit code but this sort of like does this for you this kind of looks at a data type and we're going to create a little um, example here um, so um, it looks at a data type and it is able to kind of do what the only logical thing to do is so um, i'm defining a, a data type called message payload i have read or rather this uh, like was um, mostly done by kazim uh, we read the Slack documentation. We know that um, Slack expects sort of uh, a call to one end API endpoint with a body where you specify the channel and you specify the text of what you want to post to that channel. As you can, uh, as you've already seen in our Slack channel, there's already the has cookie bot. So um, I went through the trouble of like setting that up, uh, giving it the permissions to join that specific channel and to post in that channel. So that's all. Uh, that's all stuff that you need to like do in like the Slack UI and click through it and configure. So we're not gonna like show that now. But the thing is, um, there's now a couple of type classes that are able to make use of this generic derivation in order to give an implementation for a conversion for an, an encoder from message payload to JSON. Um, 
So this is what it would look like if you have a um, uh, defined or like uh, implemented a Haskell type class. Um, it's kind of like that, but a bit more automated. So we can um, have uh, an instance of two JSON. Uh, this should be uppercase because it is a type class. Uh, message payload um, where, and then this uh, type class, uh, because we did some work ahead, this type class has to implement two encoding. And basically, um, we want uh, the one. Um, so there's one uh, encoding helper function defined by um, ASON. But what it does, it uh, takes um, it takes some settings. So we could give it um, sort of the ASON default options. Um, but so this is something that. Uh, uh, Kazim nicely did for us. Um, basically, I don't know right now what default options does, but it does something to, oh, actually here it doesn't matter. Let's do default options. So basically, um, if we had text content, um, there would be one unwanted thing where in Haskell, um, we have a habit of using camel case, uh, but JSON and some other languages, have a uh, convention where they use underscore. And so we happen to know that the uh, Slack API wants, um, uh, what's this called? Lower, not snake case, what's this called? I forgot. No, no, that is actually snake case. Ah, it is snake case, yeah. It's not, uh, this is kebab case, but this is snake case. So uh, yes, uh, Slack expects, um, expects it in uh, snake case. So actually here it doesn't matter because we don't have anything with an uppercase. But basically, um, let me just quickly copy paste what we had in, um, the, in our uh, code repo that we will share with you. You can modify some of this behavior. So you can just modify the default options. So this is kind of our record substitution syntax in Haskell, which is less nice than the one in Elm. But basically, this default options has a field called field label modifier, and we're going to change that from its default to camel case to underscore. Um, okay, cool. So let's uh, let's go ahead a little bit. Um, I'm going to paste the whole function of uh, make Slack request. So um, basically, what we're going to do is. Uh, I mean, also kind of for like some nice, uh, like uh, some nice way of distinguishing um, kind of like two types of text. So first we want the authentication token and the channel. And uh, because I'm for sure gonna mix the two up, I'm gonna define a new type that just wraps the text type. And it helps me a little bit to keep the two apart. So makes like request takes Again, our dictionary of uh, parameters that we uh, already used for the database. It's going to take an authentication token and it's going to take uh, a Slack channel that we want to post into. And it's going to uh, give, uh, do an IO action that uh, will give text back. Um, probably we could like get JSON back because the response from the Slack API is going to be something uh, in the shape of JSON. So let's see. So. Let's walk through this and then hopefully we get to coding soon. Basically, we are going to um, make a request against the Slack API hap that happens to be called the chat.post message. That's the endpoint. Um, bearer tokens uh, start with bearer space and then the token itself. Um, we went through uh, the trouble of generating such a token. So let me quickly uh, pull it out from my command line history, there we go. So this is, uh, if you want to replicate it, of course this is very sec serious security behavior that I just uh, paste uh, secrets into my code and into the, I can also paste them into the Slack channel um, uh, so that you guys can create your own bot and spam, uh, spam the channel with uh, messages. Feel free to do that. So basically, um, this I'm going to pass in as environment variables. So that's also kind of very easy, nice to do in Haskell. Um, so we're going to say which channel we post to with, with token, with which token. 
and then basically we do a base request this is, uh, again, uh, for my own friends in here, this is the same as, um, you know, sort of piping input into functions, like from the left side to the right side. This is just our syntax. It's kind of nicer than dollar, uh, because dollar we would have to nest it a little bit uh, better, it would be the other way around. Yeah. yeah. And uh, for everybody who, uh, who's been writing Haskell for a very long time and is basically just flip dollar, um, I th ah, yeah, except yeah. I think that yeah, except I think that the associativity is also um, redefined to make sense, so yeah, uh, yeah. you don't get the issues you have with regular flip dollar. Let's try it out. See if it compiles. Yeah, I mean sometimes GHC ID is is too good, so sometimes I like to make little syntax errors to see if it still works. Um, <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's uh, this is just um, applying. So basically, dollar would be um, if you have. Uh, well, it doesn't matter. We that's it's fun to explain, but uh, let's get let's move on. Um, so cool. So we do uh, we take our base request. We um, set a payload. We don't have the payload yet. We'll define it in a second. We set the request method. It's going to be post, and we set the. Um, a header and the header in HTTP is always also sort of like a key value pair. So the header will be authorization and then the token. Uh, you can like have fun with actually reverse engineering a lot of this stuff. Uh, when you have an app like Slack open, you do right click, you do inspect, uh, and then you can actually intercept like all your network requests. It's super awesome. So if you want to learn more about how HTTP works, um, this is basically um, how you should do it. You see all your requests and you can extract the tokens. You can uh, kind of find out what the syntax is if you're not sure. Cool. So uh, this is just a way to post a request and get, extract the response out of it. This uh, BS stands for byte string. So do we ever actually have a byte string? I guess this is an... Yeah, a, so the... Uh, HTTP simple library does all of its communication via byte strings, basically. So just the uh, raw bytes or arrays. Um, you can also see that there we use text encoding, uh, encode UTF-8 to turn our text value into a yeah. uh, UTF-8 encoded byte string, which is what the Slack API expects. Um, as you already said before, uh, the raw response body will be will just be a byte string. You can, um, there's also a HTTP JSON function that's very convenient, um, but you do have to have a data type with an associated from JSON instance to be able to parse that. And I was too lazy to make that for the um, Slack API return values because uh, as anybody who's done this before knows, those can get quite big. Yeah, yeah. but, but uh, we printed it out on the, on the standard output. So um, we, we will, um, uh, yeah, we'll inspect it and we will also see uh, what it returns on failure because right now we're not handling the failure. We just we just don't care. We just return it. Um, yeah. So uh, what are we doing? We're doing um, uh, we're giving it a, a payload. So the payload itself has a from JSON uh, to JSON instance. So that's cool. So we just um, basically you know set the channel ID and the message body. Uh, the message body itself we will just construct a string, right? in this case text, but yeah, we will just uh, say, okay, uh, we will say email, we will get this from the parameters. Um, this is the function that I abstracted out uh, because I don't want to write find with default uh, five to four times. So basically we're going to get, we're going to write email or dot how many and then cookies to and then the address and then for delivery and then when. Uh, intercalated with space. So uh, this is basically a list of uh, strings and we're all, just concatenate them with space in between. Cool. Um, yeah, let's stop talking and just try it out. So I uh, posted this. So I, yeah, first of all, uh, I need to use this and then also use the environment variables, right? So um, let's import, uh, import Slack. Um, actually, uh, is the proper way to do it. Um, so uh, we don't have everything yet that we need for this, right? 
So here at the same uh, endpoint where we save to the database, uh, we're probably also going to have to to do lift IO because we just defined something that is an IO action, and we do slack dot and then make slack request and then something something something. Okay, so now we need to piece together what this something 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 is. So we go back actually here. I should be able to see my own type signature. Uh, I just need to give it enough stuff. Wait, what's it complaining about? Um, so, ah, yeah, I need to also uh, use the response type of this. Uh, okay, so. do some boilerplate. So let's say uh, we call this response text and we're just going to print this out as per our very much not production ready logging. And then, oh yeah, so I need to use the, um, mm -mm, I need to use uh, the proper version of uh, put string, put stroll in. So this might will be text.io, right? Let's call it like this. So I need to, okay. Um, so this will crash, lots of undefined stuff. Well, actually, we already know one of the things to fill in, which is this the auto params dictionary. We'll just have to get the channel ID and the token out of it as well. So first one is taken care of. Bam. Um, okay, so the way to get environment variables would be uh, something here. Um, so our app is able to um, read environment variables. So we just need to use um, the right system library. Again, copy pasting so that we are a little bit faster. So we do env dot, what's it called? Lookup env. So auth token, um, what do we call it? We said we would call it a has cookie slack channel token. So we're going to get the environment variable called uh, has cookie select token. And then we have maybe channel ID. So I'm calling this maybe also to make it clear, but uh, lookup and returns uh, a maybe string because it might not be there. So um, of course it could also be an empty string, but if this is literally not defined, then it's going to return nothing. And so the other environment variable is called has cookie select channel ID. Okay, cool. Two warnings because we're not using these things yet. So um, now we kind of need to handle the case that this is nothing. So we can either handle it sort of at the endpoint, so then our app can start, but if the endpoint is hit, it's just not able to make the Slack request. Um, in this case, I think I just chose, uh, we chose to handle it at the beginning so that our app is not actually able to start if, um, uh, um, if the environment variables are not set. So this is going to be the case now. So in this case, um, we match on both existing and then in the case where uh, either one of these environment, um, environment variables doesn't exist, we just kind of put something to the, uh, we print something out to the command line and we don't actually even start the SCOTI server. We don't do anything. Um, Okay, so yeah, I mean, now this is the place we use them, right? So we have to wrap them because we uh, uh, did this really nice work with defining our own data type for it. So um, this is called slack.oauth token. So we give it the auth token text. Uh, and then let's see, uh, it is not happy because, yeah, because now uh, our environment variable is extracted, the value is extracted as a string. And so we still have to convert that to a string. So that's, uh, we're gonna have to convert that from string to text. Um, and I believe this is the a function called uh, t.pack. 
and of course any tool. So wait, let me let me do some line breaks. This is terrible. So um, we do list I O. Let's see where we can do the line breaks without getting a syntax error. So make Slack requests. Uh, this we can leave there. And okay, much nicer, much more readable. So t dot pack uh, we have to obviously apply to the string itself. Let's see. Okay, looks like that kind of compiles, uh, and then this justifiably should give us uh, for now syntax error. What did we call this? We just called it channel. Okay, cool. So what happens now is it hits the second case. So we just print out. Uh, won't start without Slack integration. So we want to start, start these two environment variables. I go copy paste um, these two environment variables into my command line and start, instead of starting ghcid uh, plane, I start them with the, with the right environment variables set. I think that's everything. So now it compiled, it restarted our server. I don't even have to refresh the page. Um, um, so, Let's set some stuff. Uh, yeah, as ASAP as possible is great. Um, Zuri has kernels at Zurich friends of Haskell.ch, I think is our website. .ch or .com, I don't know. No, something went wrong. Okay, so clearly, wait, let's see. Um, what happened? That's debug. Do we leave anything open? Um, so now it would be good to have some uh, uh, some proper exception handling, huh? Because we throw in. Can you see the mistake? Oh, we didn't return anything. Uh, that's uh, that's okay. So. Uh, Let's also, you still have the error call in there. Oh, yeah, that's also not a good idea. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, there should be uh, commit hooks for these sort of like little production uh, hacks. Uh, so, yeah, I return some HTML. I call it auto submitted. Let's actually, um, uh, let's also kind of make uh, this stand out a little bit more. So let's do a Slack response uh, so that we clearly see what Slack is giving back. Okay, let's do it again. It worked. So first of all, uh, well, we don't know if it worked, right? Um, so we can try doing it with an empty auth token because the Slack response, we don't, we don't actually check it. So uh, I think uh, that would be definitely kind of uh, something to do here. To check the Slack, oh no, I, uh, let's do it again. Um, so we um, get we extract the parameters. So again, this is still printed from our little put string, and then we have this Slack response okay uh, equals true. So that would be the thing to check, and then a bunch of other stuff that we don't care about. I mean, actually, it returns back the information we gave it, um, and then this is the normal logging that we've uh, had from uh, the Scotty middleware in the first place. So I think all you happy people in the Slack channel. Uh, yeah, you got messages from uh, Has Cookie Bot. Good, there you go. Um, that concludes uh, the demo part. It went on uh, a good deal longer than I uh, hoped it would be. I hope it was like both not like too fast for some people or too slow for other people. Um, I want to, um, yeah, so I would love to open this up and everybody like to switch on, uh, to unmute themselves, uh, to ask questions. It might get chaotic, we'll uh, take that bet. Um, let me actually quickly copy paste the um, uh, code repo that you can just clone. Um, so it has like pretty much exactly the features that we have here. I mean, um, uh, yeah, there might be a couple more comments. So I'm posting that into the Slack channel, but uh, yeah, you can also just go on GitHub and then Kazim's uh, account, so C-H-Y-S-I and then slash has cookie. You can clone this. Um, and basically I'll stay here as long as there are people that want to hang out. I like took out uh, 
some uh, drinks from my fridge. So I'll just hang out here, answer questions. Um, I um, Let's actually get back to the presentation. I would love for you guys to come up with interesting ideas. I think, I hope I showed a little bit that like, a lot of problems you want to solve fall under mostly this pattern. Like you want to save something to a database, you want to call an external API. And so here's like some ideas for you guys. If, uh, yeah, I'm still sharing my screen. So you can also send a message to Telegram. You can integrate with Stripe. That's just an HTTP, that's just a REST API. So you can just kind of do a little bit of work. I mean, now we did it in like, what, an hour and 50 minutes, but if you work on it a little bit for like a couple of weekends, you can set up a website with payment integrated. That's so awesome. You can like experiment a little bit with deploying. There's ways to deploy to Heroku. You can like rent um, virtual machines from like Hetzner for like two bucks, 45 a month and try and deploy on that. Um, you can of course now like use a proper uh, HTML library like Blazor Lucid. You could also, I mean, in a production app, at some point, you would probably split the API that serves sort of like the functionality and the part that serves your website. You probably split it into two separate things because it makes sense to just, if especially if you have a static website, to just serve it like uh, from a different endpoint. Um, but yeah, so you can make the Slack bot interactive. Like there's documentation on the API where you can do like slash and then has cookie bot do this or that. Um, you can use a post. I can also like while while we are here, uh, if anyone's interested, I'll copy paste a small snippet of how you set up a Postgres connection pool. So you would use a similar library. It's called PostgreSQL Simple, um, and um, there is like I didn't uh, like point that out too much. Um, Ah, Ralph, I will answer your question in a second. Um, I didn't like uh, spend too much time on this, but basically. SQLite is like one file. And to me right now, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with the settings. So if you have a thousand requests coming in and Haskell, uh, the runtime spins off like a thousand uh, green threads and they all try to access um, the same database, presumably with the same connection. I'm not sure if it would be blocked or it would crash or if there is like, I think there's settings that you can enable to at least scale it to like hundreds of people. But um, the way you would do it with Postgres is it's a little bit more robust. So you would open a connection pool. So instead of opening a new connection for every request that you have, you kind of have like you know five or ten um, long living connections that you rotate that you reuse for for requests. Um, so it's it's super fast, super scalable, super fun to use in my opinion. And yeah do anything else you want. I've seen a lot of uh, examples that uh, use in-memory databases basically with like uh, TVAS, which is a way of um, uh, like changing variables uh, in memory in a transactional way so that you can uh, sort of guarantee that certain consistencies that databases also give you. So go wild. If you want to code, if you just want to talk, that's uh, all fine by me. I did um, collect sort of all the references that I came across um, and I'm going to post this in the Slack channel as well. Um, and um, so, uh, bye Steffel. <laughs> um, I'm going to, uh, so these are great. So some of these use um, Scotty, some of these use uh, Spock. Uh, some of this one uses uh, Nix and Servant in a single file. It's super awesome to read, like really readable code, uh, super inspiring. Um, yeah, and so you have just a, a lot. When I started this, I didn't know that there were this many resources. So there's maybe not enough like tutorials that explain things step by step, which is what I try to do now. But there is a lot of very readable example code that it's a little bit harder to consume than a straight up tutorial, but it's still really great and it still contains like a lot of information that you might want to use for your own projects. Um, yeah, so uh, Alan Package websites, that's the uh, only uh, bigger application that I know that's actually um, written in this other framework called Snap. That one, I, as far as I know, doesn't use the web application interface, so that's kind of like more its own thing, but um, that's just to show like you can, use, you can write a lot of really serious apps, even with super simple frameworks. If any one of you was like at the Hasura meetup, um, or if you know about it, Hasura is basically a server that uh, gives you a GraphQL API 
on top of a Postgres database in like a super easy way. Uh, the server itself is written in uh, Spock. So it doesn't even use servant. So you can use like extremely scalable production. Uh, you can do extremely scalable stuff with these frameworks. So they make me super happy to use. Um, yeah, go ahead. Don't be too shy to like uh, just unmute your microphone. Um, say anything you want to say. Ask anything you want to ask. That's it for me. Cool. So thank you, Yuri. Um, I guess before we really go to just talking uh, whatever, I think my final comment that I would have is, um, you know, Haskell tends to, the, the big sticking point with graduating from, let's say, beginner Haskell to intermediate Haskell tends to be precise, this sort of thing. Um, you do a lot of textbook exercises, uh, but then you don't know how to actually graduate from that to code that actually does a lot of, um, you know, effectful things that actually does a lot of IO. That's where I got stuck for years. And I think once you, once you actually get into it, I mean, you can see that this was about 160 lines of Haskell code. Um, so it's not actually very difficult and you could, you could make this pretty production grade with maybe twice as much. So that's still not a very big code base. Yeah. And I have, um, written my own stuff like sort of running in production and uh yeah I, that's how i learned and it's kind of like uh it works super well never crashes it's just it's extremely satisfying uh, it's very robust and i think it's worth the little um um the little humps and bumps you sometimes go through um yeah i, I want to thank you all for doing this i'm i'm both british and american and uh, we're not working at all over here in Raleigh, but so I thought, I why not why not join this meetup? Yeah, so, so thank cool. you. And yeah, it's um, really great to have you here. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I win the prize for being the furthest away from what Zurich. That's I think everyone's in Zurich or around about there, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's so awesome. I mean this <laughs> is yeah. Um, but Mike, I, I, I had a, what what I wanted to make was a comment and perhaps leading to a question. Uh -huh. A lot of the value that I get from watching these things is how you debug uh, the, the tricks. It's not, you know, how do you get yourself out of a problem? I uh -huh. wish there was a book on that. Yes. Yeah? So the, yeah, I think as far as I know, um, well, it, it's not entirely how you debug, but it's uh, this book called uh, Finding Failure and Success in Haskell, also oh. by Julie Moranuki. And oh, that's, um, worth a, that's worth a, a note in Slack. Thank you for that. I, I heard that it's uh, I heard that it's really good, and I know that her, her previous book is so excellent. So I think um, so. Let me Google that, and then I'll paste yeah. you. The link. And, and I have to go with a four o'clock. We're still working, of course, remotely. So I have a oh. four o'clock call coming up. Yeah. So Makes me so happy that you came from so far away. That's such a positive <laughs> side effect of this us having to do it remotely. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I want to attend the London ones if I can as well, yes. All right. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Cheers, mate. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to copy paste the name of this book. Um, I can also just actually paste the Lean Pub link. Yeah, I just did that. Ah, you did that. Okay, cool. Way ahead of me. Wait, so there was, um, I, um, there were a couple of other questions. Oh yeah, Ralph, uh, when would you use lenses for this kind of application? So good question. Yeah, I'll hang, on for, I'll hang on for the question. <laughs> okay. And um, so uh, I avoided using lenses because I wanted to keep like sort of the, um, Haskell has a lot of syntax and I wanted to keep the amount of syntax small. I didn't even use a single bind operator, even though I wish I did in like small space. So uh, lenses, is great. So you saw how we defined our own like uh, data type, right? It just had two fields. It was super like basic. Um, so even if it had ten fields, you would be f fine using it and sort of modifying the the fields with just plain old Haskell syntax. Lenses is great when you have um, very nested uh, data types. So basically, you know, a record that contains a field that is like of type another record and um, maybe sometimes you need to like give back a copy of this but with this field with this subfield changed and so on and so forth so lenses has like a lot of these uh, utility operators also plain functions to 
to sort of do this nested changing of stuff. So you can say, well, a little bit like you're used from imperative languages, right? You can say um, uh, person dot address dot street uh, number. Um, so lenses can do a little bit of that, just like way more powerful. So instead of just extracting person dot address dot street number, it could also say, well, apply a function to person dot address dot street number, but give me back then the modified person for that. Or it could um, kind of, yeah, it can, it can do a bunch of stuff like this. And uh, it is very, um, it's extremely clever. So it has like really solid fundamentals. I think that I read an article about how lenses have been dis rediscovered like eight times <laughs> because it is, uh, you can sort of bring it down to pretty fundamental properties about data types. Um, and it does like a lot of this handling for you if you are like, um, if your subfields are maybe, or you have union types. So if you access sort of like one branch of a union type um, and modify it or like just extract it, of course, if your value has like the other branch of that union type, you would get back nothing. So Lens sort of like handles all of that, but it is a big machinery to learn. It feels like using learning like an additional, like small domain specific yeah. language. It's worth it, I think for bigger projects, and that goes back to my earlier point, just get the stuff done first. And then if you find that it is uh, like a really quality of life improvement, then yeah, great, use lenses. Lenses is awesome. There's a couple of different ones. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I think it's a book like the one you've shown, the, what I'm thinking of um, is now is Optics. There's a book, I think it's mm -hmm. called Optics. Which yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah which, good, which suggests that there's quite a, lineage to this way of doing things as yeah well. so lenses are just like uh, one of a subset like one possible kind of optic there's prisms there's uh, like yeah. andreas maybe also kazim will know for sure more than me about this it's super interesting because i think i've heard like people being really excited once they understood what traverse does because traverse is one of these things like fold oh, yeah. or map yeah. where you can like um do like where you suddenly see a lot of different problems actually are the same like underlying uh, problem. Uh, like you can use the same abstraction to handle different problems. It's, I'm sure it's cool. It's something I might look into more in, in the future. Yeah. Uh, sorry, thank you. I have to go. <laughs> bye -bye. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Um, do I? I'm not still sharing my screen, right? Uh, you still are currently. Oh, I'm an idiot. Okay, let's stop sharing. And then, ah, uh, because when I share, I can't see the videos. So now I can switch to the video gallery. That's great. Hey, Niklas. <laughs> awesome. Um, did anyone? So yeah, this was a bit of an experiment with regards to coding in along, and I now realize that probably it went way too fast. So if I had to listen and code at the same time, I think for me it would have been impossible. Um, so. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think it was too fast. I got another question though. Yeah. Um, if, yeah, so if I, if I want to do some like other IO stuff outside of Scotty, mm -hmm. like, you know, maybe watch the Slack channel for other responses or something, um, I don't want to do it like in a different thread or in a different program. Like, can you asynchronously like interweave the Scotty IO with other stuff using something? That's a really so in many ways, actually, um, when it comes to, I, I, th I guess the specific example you mentioned, um, you would probably want to use just Slack's callback API so you can just do it via Scotty. But otherwise, yeah, I think, um, Somebody even linked it. I think Kirill maybe maybe linked it, but uh, Michael Snoyberg also has this async library mm -hmm. um, that you can use for precisely that sort of thing relatively easily. Um, uh, what would you do like use hash builds. if you wanted to do that stuff? Like you'd use that callback, or if you wanted to use something that didn't have a callback, would you just like make a separate thread for handling it? Or I wouldn't do a thread, right? Because the callback or like what what you do, you give it a hook. So you give it your own API that it would then, an endpoint that it would then hit. So basically you don't have to even pull at any time like uh, Slack does something, 
it would call your API and then that endpoint action would get triggered. So that's oh, okay. the most yeah. elegant way to do it. Um, yeah. I don't have- But yeah, assuming, assuming you do, um, assuming you do want to do something where you have to poll, um, then yeah, I would do it that way. Um, I think pretty much everything that's asynchronous in Haskell uses the same underlying green thread machinery. So I would just fork off a thread and, um, and find uh -huh. some way of interweaving things. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, a tip that I have is like, again, going back to Julie Moranuki, she does a lot of stuff. Um, she has this, uh, um, website with another with Chris, I forgot his last name, called Type Classes. The coolest thing they have there. Um, uh, Alan, uh, right? Uh, yeah, uh, no, the other one. Um, the other Chris. So I'm going to paste this also into the Slack channel. So it's called the Haskell Phrasebook. And it is so cool because it is basically um, a, a bunch of very small programs that uh, highlight things like threading and um, like, uh, I wanted to say multiprocessing, but I don't see it in here. Um, so there's a lot of things that I considered like to be a little bit more advanced Haskell, but it's just like there as a, as a really approachable uh, bunch of examples with explanations. So uh, threading is in there. So I don't know, yeah, how you interleave the, threading with Scotty itself. I don't have a good intuition for how Scotty spins off threads and stuff. That would definitely be something to look into. Um, That's cool. Thanks. Yeah. Nice. Um, so I'm going to disappear for like a minute because I like lost my beer somewhere and I wanted to. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, While you're gone, I can explain the uh, I yes, can please. explain the th uh, like threading with uh, web frameworks. Oh, but I want to hear the explanation. Well, then then we'll wait. One second. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Success. All right. Okay. Yes. Okay, shall I, shall I screen share it super quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah gladly, yeah. Explaining. Uh, let me just find the, here we go. Mm -hmm. so I have a couple too many workspaces today. <laughs> okay, I just copied the Scotty example from the website, right? Mm -hmm. You can see this, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that's like this, right? It's just like a function that we can run, that we run here and we can import from the async library, uh, which by the way, in its next release will have significantly better docs because I recently pull requested significantly better docs. So it tells you like in current docs, it starts off with the things that you definitely shouldn't do. And most people just copy the first box from the docs and then they end up very unlucky when the actual thing that you should do is this kind of stuff. So you can say um, that with, with async, you can say that you want to start some thread in the background and then do something. But then when the inner thing terminates, you want that the outer thing also gets cleaned up, uh, for example. So what you can do is that you would just say, you, you import the async module. And then you can say, I want to perform this inner thing but I want to, at the side, start something. And when this inner thing terminates, for example, if you press Control C or what, then the outer thing also stops running. So there's this with, with async function that um, takes a function that runs in the background and then inside you run something inside. So I'm just gonna do with async. Yeah, and then I can say my background function like this. And then I say, uh, th this thing can also, like, I can get a handle to that thing, but I will ignore it. So I'll put that in there. And then I say, my background function. Um, so for example, I say, this is IO unit. So it doesn't do anything. And then I can say something like forever, I don't know, um, uh, put stern, hello, and then uh, thread delay one second like this. So then I have the, the 
web server running and like spawning its own threads and like one background thread that just periodically does something in that case I, I can kill this actually and I think that's that's how you do these kind of like worker things that you may want to spawn for example or or something that does something regularly pulls some website or does something on slack or what if it is regular of course if you have something that is event driven you may not need that right you may just want to register some kind of callback handler that then gets called by something else but in many cases you need to do something that's just time and sleep based and then you can do it this way and the uh, async module has already like a lot of documentation. I would recommend that if you want to actually get started with it as a beginner, you should just go to GitHub and get the latest unreleased documentation there because it's um, much easier to understand now and the next release will have it. And I think that's all that's there is to say about this basic thing. Right then, uh, hey. right here, another, uh, sorry, did someone else have a follow-up question? Oh no, I was just saying great, yeah. yeah. Um, so then can you help me get some intuition about, I open a SQLite connection in the main uh, IO uh, context, and then I pass it around, right? But if there are um, a lot of concurrent requests, Haskell will, or, or at least uh, with the help of uh, warp, will spin off some green threads and, and handle those. So what happens to the database connection? Is that just like, Oh, it's always the same handle, right? So it's always just one single connection. Do you know what happens? Does it, um, is it blocked on the IO? So one thread has to wait for the other one to close it uh, or actually to be done with it or do you know? Yes, I can answer that. So I'll make the example real quick. Um, uh, for example, using SQLite simple, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then I'll, just get uh, this connection as he mentioned. So mm -hmm. for example, here uh, we have a, where is it? This guy, let's replace the async here and let's get rid of this mm -hmm. and take this, this thing here. So in that case, we open at the beginning of the program, a database connection, and then we do something with it. So for example, if you get this, we can do like, I don't know, do something with con, for example, and then some somebody you could call this thing in parallel, right? So yeah. for the case of SQLite, this connection is one thing and it will be shared by uh, all the green threads that will be started. One green thread will be started for each uh, client that may join here to your web server, start talking to it. This connection will be shared across those and the actual underlying SQLite C functions that are provided by this library here, they can be called, yes, fully concurrent and the SQLite library itself will take, it is thread safe. So it, it supports having multiple things from the same process talking to it at the same time and it will handle that very simply. And it will do its locking internally essentially. Yeah. The I'm only sure thing that you can- sure yeah, sorry. SQLite has uh, three different modes. Uh, so it can be thread safe or not thread safe. And it depends on, its, uh, on how it was compiled and I think you can also adjust it when uh, opening the connection. So I'm not sure what the default mm -hmm. is, but- um, I thought, I thought the default problem. was not thread safe. I thought, uh, yeah. So it, there's a big difference to make also between whether you have a single process with multiple threads accessing an SQLite database, which is what we're doing here, and multiple different programs, so multiple different processes actually accessing the same database file. And the latter thing SQLite does not support. You can have multiple different processes that read from the database at the same time, but you can always only have a single one that mutates right to the database at the same time. However, you, depending on options that you set, because it's very configurable, as far as I remember, you can uh, modify in parallel if you have, um, if you have, or let's say there is no risk or what, or no like huge drawback of using it um, from the same process. SQLite internally, of course, may still decide that it will fulfill your parallel request bus just by blocking and uh, locking the database and doing one after the other. But in general, because SQLite is like usually IO bound, right? You usually do not do anything that benefits of um, 
Like there's no weighting that you usually do. When we use concurrency, uh, let's say for networking or what, right? We often do that because most of the time we actually have to wait for something. If we download a page from the internet, we may want to, um, we may re request something and then we have, I don't know, 50 milliseconds in which our CPU has nothing to do. That's why we do multiple at the same time. But with uh, local database access, which is doing direct IO, there often is not much benefit in like actually doing lots of things in parallel, especially if you have a spinning disk, for example, then may yeah. even be worse to do that. Um, but if you use multi-processing, where you have multiple processes, SQLite will take a file lock on the file system as it supports as as it supports that, um, and so you will have one process blocking entirely until the other process is done with it. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, that's I mean essentially SQLite is just a very cool wrapper around fopen, right? So it has all of the limitations of being a wrapper around fopen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it would be interesting to sort of test it out and see at what point does it get saturated with like something like a framework like this. Like would it do 100 concurrent connections with like really small SQL statements that maybe finish in like a, a third of a second or would it um, like for, for example, just for reading would be interesting. Um, I mean, in general, if you have plain read access, then this should be able to scale all the way up to your memory bandwidth, essentially, because if it's a small database, specifically all information will be in the cached in RAM anyway. Like they would, will not actually hit any kind of disk anymore. Um, so usually I would expect as long as your queries are relatively simple and your database is not so large, let's say, I don't know, two gigabytes of stuff. And then you crawl through that. If you want to find something in some kind of web server that you're writing, then for small things, I would usually expect that um, you will find other bottlenecks before you hit an SQLite bottleneck on that front. Yeah. Very cool. In my experience working with SQLite in Python though, um, it gets for right accesses, it gets very slow relatively quickly. Um, so databases that are already just a few hundred megabytes in size are noticeably slower than, um, can be noticeably slower than databases that are a few dozen megabytes in size. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. But that also, obviously, it depends on the nature of the hard disk, right? The spinning disk is the, is your enemy in that scenario. Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't had a spinning disk in, in years. <laughs> All right. 